Hi everybody, welcome to Synthetic Intelligence Forum Online. My name is Vic Pant and I'm very happy to welcome today an esteemed colleague and a dear friend of mine to our live stream. Paul Wagner is the interim CTO of the Government of Canada and, and I'm very grateful to Paul for, for being a friend and for being a mentor to me in the federal public service. I remember when I moved from Toronto to Ottawa and I was transitioning from the private sector to the public sector, Paul uh, was one of the first colleagues who I, I had the, uh, the good fortune and the occasion of meeting and Paul really sat me down and explained to me how technology works in Ottawa and how <laughs> Ottawa does technology and I think that's really helped me. To, 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 be, uh, to be able to deliver some results uh, in my department. But very happy to have Paul here who's got a whole of government view uh, and he's really gonna benefit us and advantage us with, with the experience and the insight that he brings to the table in all range of technologies, but specifically in artificial intelligence and data science in the federal government context. So Paul, welcome to the live stream. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Very humble. It's humbling to look at the, the, the list of people you have, uh, you know, that came before and will come after uh, this talk and, uh, you know, really pleased to be here today. And yeah, I mean, uh, feelings mutual, Vic. We've, uh, we, we learn a lot from each other. And uh, yeah, hopefully today's session, you know, the folks online uh, absolutely don't be shy to, to uh, reach out with your questions, your thoughts, your comments. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're all learning as we move through this journey together, as I think we'll, we'll see as we, uh, we go through some of the, the topics that you want to cover today. Uh, absolutely, Paul. I 100% agree with you and I reflect very fondly on all our conversations where we keep them tight and we keep them loose at the same time. You know, the conversation <laughs> exactly. goes wherever it goes. Uh, but uh, Paul, I, I know I know your background and I really appreciate all the great work you've done. But tell us a little bit, just a three part question, maybe just to kind of get this conversation started. Tell folks a little bit about your professional background. Tell us about your current role and tell us specifically how in your current role you focus on AI strategy for the government of Canada. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, so a little bit about myself. Um, spent 10 years working in the private sector uh, in Montreal before uh, joining uh, the public sector back in 1999 um, and um, worked my way through a number of different roles within the federal public service, including uh, being chief information officer at uh, uh, Justice Canada, Library and Archives Canada, uh, National uh, Research Council, and uh, most recently now uh, have been uh, asked to take on the role of interim chief technology officer for the federal government. So working at Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat um, is a role that sees me uh, responsible for the overarching governance, the strategy, the technology strategy for the federal government. Um, now that's you know important to say that from for people that that don't know how government works, uh, you know with 160 or so different organizations within the federal government, each each organization is responsible for the delivery of their own programs and services to Canadians and, and Canadian businesses. Um, but we are moving uh, Treasury Board Secretariat and, and Mark Briard, who is the interim uh, chief information officer, and myself are charged with ensuring that there is cohesion in that in that uh, for, across the 160 organizations. Um, we have a digital vision in terms of where we see the government of Canada going writ large, and the expectation around departments and CIOs uh, to be able to build into that vision in their own specific verticals of service delivery. And so my role is to, uh, you know, I have an oversight function from uh, major major projects, uh, major initiatives that are going on, uh, a function around governance and, and enterprise planning to ensure that uh, we have visibility into what the departments are doing and influence, and then uh, some of the uh, some of the policy areas as well in terms of uh, uh, the policy on on service and digital and, and helping make sure that that gets uh, implemented in a, in a way that's consistent across uh, across government. From an art, from an AI perspective, um, you know, as I mentioned, Vic, you know, we're we're, we're early on in, in our uh, engagement in this one. Um, we have, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, we've put out uh, some policy direction uh, to departments in terms of how uh, they should be thinking about implementing artificial intelligence in their environments, and we've also built a a great tool that uh, that helps determine some of the. Uh, the impact again. We'll talk about you know what what the impact of of AI can have on a program delivery. Very interesting, Paul. And you know uh, what I find very fascinating about your role is that uh, myself being at Natural Resources Canada, and I think a lot of uh, folks know that Natural Resource Canada scientists and technologists have a long and storied history of of implementing artificial intelligence. Whether it was the symbolic systems approaches, whether it's the connectionist approaches now, including but not limited to deep learning, reinforcement learning, etc. Uh, but and I have the good fortune of having line of sight into that great work historically, and also what's happening now and will happen in the future. What I find fascinating about 
your role is, as you just described with yourself and your colleague Mark Bruyard, you have view of the entire government. So that to me is extremely fascinating. And I can I can totally see how today in our conversation we'll be connecting a lot of dots and, and yeah. really seeing where synergies and complementarities exist. So my first question, Paul, based on something you just touched on is, so in your mind and in your experience, which factors are essential to guarantee the success of any AI strategy? Well, guarantees, a, you know, that, that, that's a word you got to be careful with, right? Um, I'm not going to give you anything that's going to guarantee success, but I think, you know, as, as organizations, uh, departments, uh, specifically from the public service perspective, are looking at deploying um, an AI strategy or looking at deploying AI and thinking about how to, how to uh, adopt that, um, it really starts with having a, a, a clear understanding of what your business strategy is. Um, if you don't have that, then you know you're not you're not actually aware of the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And so, you know, organizations, if you have a chief operating officer, if you have a, a clear business strategy, that's really where you want to start looking at this. And then, you know, so that's that would be the first tenant of of success for me is really understanding your role and and your place in 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 your service ecosystem. The second would be around around data. And I think this is one where, you know, we've talked about data for an awful long time in, in the federal government and 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 beyond. Um, but having a very clear data strategy and having a very clear data um, model within your organization is absolutely critical to be able to leverage AI. Without that, you're, you're kind of shooting in the dark. And, and I think a lot of departments um, are now, you know, we, we had a, 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 an academic discussion around data in the past. Uh, it, what AI does and, and you know, a lot of the, the integration of systems that we're starting to see across uh, departments and to deliver a more seamless service to, to Canadians and Canadian businesses um, is departments are really starting to dig in on their data. And, and we're starting to see the, you know, the resurgence. We had a, and, and again, in the federal government, we had a, um, a data framework and data strategy call out um, a number of years ago. And that really, uh, that was uh, put out by our, our, the CIO at the time, Alex Benet, and uh, our, our uh, clerk of the Privy Council, uh, Michael Warnick. And they put out a, a challenge to CIOs and to deputy heads to come up with um, a sense of what their departmental data strategies and data frameworks look like. And, and really, that was the precursor for us to be able to start to go down this road of, of, of AI and, and, and leveraging machine learning in, in terms of, of accelerating the work that we're doing. Um, and, and I think departments, it, it made departments realize what, where their level of maturity was in that. And it is, it is very much sawtooth in, in, in different departments. So, you know, having that understanding of where you want to go from a business strategy perspective, having an understanding of the tools you have available to you in terms of data. Um, and, and then I'd say the last piece before you, you know, we get into sort of the production element of it is, is have a sandbox where you can play with this in a very safe environment. Because uh, the one thing I can guarantee is you will make mistakes. Um, you know, working with the data, understanding what, uh, how those data elements work together, understanding what the, the governance is around it. You know, you need to have a safe place, a safe sandbox that's not only a technology sandbox, but a, a sandbox where you can start to think about some of the policy implications, some of the procedural implications, um, and certainly some of the technologies, some great technologies out there, and there's a lot of black box technologies out there. You want to be able to play with some of that and, um, you know, in, in a very safe space. So to me, those would be the elements of, that would be required. Uh, again, not a guarantee. Um, I, won't, I won't sign on the dotted line on that one, um, but I, those are some of the foundational elements from my perspective. I think I think that's that's a great answer, uh, Paul. Thank you for sharing your insights because you're right. You know, I think guarantee is a very strong term in this context. And as you've so articulately described, the building blocks, the characteristics, if you will. So what I'd like to ask you is, Paul. Then the next logical question that follows in my mind is, what does success look like to you? What do you attribute to a successful AI strategy? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's 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 a great it's a great follow on. I mean, I think you know it does go back to that business strategy. Is is you know um, there's a lot of there's a lot of hype around AI today, and there's a lot of hype around leveraging AI. Uh, there's some great you know great places where where you know it can it can help in terms of virtual assistants, chatbots, and 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 so forth. And I think you know that's probably the most well trodden path we have from a from a service delivery perspective today. Certainly on the science side, you know, I, I had the the honor of of working with uh, many uh, world renowned researchers at the National Research Council, who was uh, you know day job is primarily focused on on building machine learning algorithms. And and uh, developing the next generation of AI, um, so you know I'm looking at the the implementation and the the the, uh, the application of, of those systems, 
And but it really does come down to you know if, if your business strategy is and I'll use CBSA as an example and this is completely hypothetical but you know I mean we'll, we'll get there is you know if, if your goal is to get the the most number of people through a border in a uh, you know in a timely fashion but in, in a secure fashion um, you know if you have an ability to speed up the process that a single uh, border service agent has in terms of the the iterations that he or she goes through when they're standing in front of a of a traveler. Or leverage AI, uh, and whether that's for travelers or for packages and so forth, the out, you know you you have a very defined business outcome, and, and that's the that business outcome is the success uh, criteria for a, an AI strategy. It, it's not about implementing a technology. It's not about leveraging a specific tool. It's not about saying that you've got AI in your in your technology stack. Those are all you know really great things, cool things. But if you liken it back to you know cloud ten years ago when we started talking about cloud and saying. You know what's 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 your cloud strategy? Having a cloud strategy of having all of your applications in the cloud, okay, that's a metric. Um, but to me, is are we actually leveraging the power of cloud, or in this case, the power of AI, to deliver on 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 the outcomes that we're trying to achieve? So those two things are so tightly coupled, and I think you know the the AI strategy has to be owned by the business. Um, I think the the CIO uh, you know is a is an absolutely important interlocutor in that model. But I think if you have a, a chief, uh, you know, operating officer or a chief um, experience officer at, who's looking at what those outcomes are, they need to own that AI strategy, obviously informed by the CIO. Very interesting, Paul. That's that's great, and and I, I really appreciate how you've mapped sort of the capabilities of AI, sort of more as a toolkit, as a bundle of of, of competencies that you ultimately have to map back to organizational imperatives, uh, if you will, departmental uh, priorities and plans. Very interesting. So uh, in that in that uh, realm, then, Paul, I think a question that comes to my mind is, and I know in your preamble you touched upon the the tools, the uh, the um, directive on automated decision making, as well as the algorithmic impact assessment. But broadly speaking, Paul how can ethical and responsible considerations be incorporated into a holistic AI strategy? Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, no good presentations is, is you, know, you have to have a prop, right? So the directive on, uh, on, on automated decision making that we, we put out back in 2019, I think, you know, um, what, what it, uh, AI does, and, you know, I'll include AI as part of a, a broader uh, digital uh, mindset and digital strategy. I often liken it to a Trojan horse, a good, a good, the good type of Trojan horse. But when you start talking about, you know, AI, digital, you have to necessarily talk about the processes, the policies, uh, the procedures that you have uh, in place within your organization. You talk about privacy. I know you had Anne Kabukian on uh, recently. You know, fantastic discussion around privacy. All of these elements that are, you know, germane to the way that you deliver services today. Um, need to be very well understood, need to be very, very well documented, um, because when you start to leverage artificial intelligence, you start to leverage, um, you know, massive data sets um, and, and the, possi you know, the possibility for inherent bias in that space um, is, is absolutely critical. And so, you know, back to my example of, of the, the border service agent, if you have a border service agent that has a, you know, an unconscious bias, that's one individual with a single traveler or multiple travelers in, in, in front of them. If you take that bias unknowingly and implement that in terms of a systemic approach, uh, you know it was a problem when it was one individual. It's a really big problem when it becomes part of your your uh, your foundational systems. And so I think you know what this forces our you know organizations to do a little bit as we as I as I mentioned around the data, is it really uh, it, it's a cause for pause around do we have the right um, policy frameworks in place? Do we understand what the ethical implications of the decisions that we make? whether leveraging AI or not, uh, are. And so, you know, when you think about that end user, what is the impact on, the, in the case of federal government, what's the impact on the citizen? What's the impact on, on Canadian business? And I think, you know, having those discussions around AI, and this is why, you know, I, I'm saying it's the, it's the business owner, ultimately, that owns that AI strategy, because they have the purview of ensuring that all of those elements are taken into consideration, not only, again, for AI, but, but just in, in terms of service delivery. I think um, you know one of the tools, and Vic, you mentioned it. You know, we we came out with an algorithmic impact assessment. Um, I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of black box uh, solutions out there, and what this algorithmic impact assessment you know allows organizations to do, and you can you can find it online. It's uh, if you go to Canada.ca and search out uh, search that out, you'll find uh, you'll find the, that tool. But it's a tool that allows you to um, 
assess what the impact is of leveraging an algorithm uh, in, 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 a, uh, in a service delivery model. So, you know, just starting from that point, and again, thinking back to, you know, the, the concept around having a, a sandbox to be able to test some of these things, you can start to work through those implications, both, you know, from a procedural perspective, from an impact perspective on your end user, what does it mean? How, how, does, it, how does AI sit in terms of your overall uh, service delivery model? Is it, is it replacing the human interaction? Is it enhancing the human interaction? I think all of those things can be tested through in, in, that, uh, in that sandbox. But I do think, you know, from from an ethical and, and responsibility uh, perspective, those are things that need to be taken into consideration before you get to an AI. Uh, they get they get exacerbated when you talk about leveraging that kind of technology. Um, but I think those are conversations that you need to have around service delivery writ large. Very interesting, Paul. Thank you for that. Uh, I think you know it's quite interesting. You you talked about the the building blocks of a successful AI strategy. You talked about what success looks like. You talked about ethics and responsibility. Uh, I want to take a look from the other side now and ask you the question that what are typically some pitfalls or common pitfalls that should be avoided uh, in the development or in the implementation of an AI strategy? Yeah, you know, great question. And, and I mean, this is, you know, it, it's it's a little bit, and I'll liken it again to, to the experience we have with, with cloud um, rushing to market, um, you know, so there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of companies, a lot of organizations that are selling um, solutions to you know to to, to business problems uh, leveraging AI, um, and I think it's very it's very seductive to want to grab onto one of those and and just hit you know hit the market. Uh, the statistics, of course, that they they present and uh, you know are, are are fantastic. They show that you know you're going to improve your business response time. You're going to improve your client retention. Whatever the that outcome that you're trying to achieve is is. Um, but I think you know the biggest pitfall is is going too fast to market with this. This is a you know it's a uh, it's very much an altering technology. You know, whereas other technologies that we've we've seen and technology trends throughout the year throughout the years throughout the decades, um, you know, don't have the potential of impact that this does. You know, we're we're actually dis you know leveraging the decision making capabilities of technology based on data sets um, that may or may not be. Um, uh, you know, proper, um, the impact is, is, is absolutely incredible. And so I think that the, the biggest pitfall is a having it, you know, led by a technologist that comes in and says, Hey, I've got a technology that's going to solve all of our problems. Uh, problem number one, red flag, uh, you know, red flag number two is, um, look, we've got to get this thing implemented by March 31st. Otherwise we're dead in the water. Um, that again would be a red flag for me in terms of your service strategy, wondering, you know, why can't you actually leverage uh, your existing service strategy until you, you start to use AI? And I think, you know, the third one, the third pitfall is, is thinking that it is only a technology play, thinking that, you know, you can go to, from a government Canada perspective, you go to a standing offer, you pull off an AI platform, and you implement it. And as we've talked about, you know, in the last couple of minutes, uh, you know, around all of the other implications uh, that, are, that are called into play in implementing AI, it would be very, very, very easy to look at it as a technology play, and you know, as we did with cloud ten years ago. You know, we said, "Well, listen, let's set up an account on Amazon, uh, and and off we go." Um, we now know, from a security perspective, from a privacy perspective, from an interoperability perspective, um, you know, it's it's not that easy. Of course, it's that easy to implement, uh, or it can be. Um, but it, it, when you start actually thinking about it in the broader context, and certainly when you think about it from a um, uh, from a Canadian citizen uh, perspective, uh, whose currency with the federal government is trust. Um, these decisions and, and, and decisions to implement AI have to be taken very, very in a very calculated manner and in a in a very holistic manner. Which is, you know, one of the reasons when we came up with the the directive on automated decision making, you know, it talks to the the parties that need to be involved in those discussions. Um, and it's 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 you know, if you if you take the time to to look through it, if you're a policy uh, wonk. Um, it, you know, it, it's not a technology play. The technology underpins it, but uh, you know, the, the biggest pitfall I think would be thinking that it's simply a technology play and, and push it through. Interesting, Paul. Thank you. Uh, there's a question that actually I have, and then I noticed there's a question that came up in the chat as well. So perhaps I can sort of ask my question and then maybe focus the question a bit more based on what's in the sure. chat. So, so we know, Paul, that in the industry there are a number of AI strategy management type frameworks. Uh, 
my, my question to you was going to be, you know, have you found one that you have found to be particularly useful? The question that came in the chat was also re related, which is that, uh, is there a, uh, a, a capability maturity model or a competence model that you sort of go to, Paul, when you're looking at sort of the design and implementation of AI strategies? So that, I mean, we, I think that, and it's a great question from, uh, so thank you, Gordon. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, um, as I said at the outset, you know, we're, we're early on in our, in our journey in this one, right? And so, uh, you know, we're starting to leverage, we've, we, we've got a directive and it's important in organizations, um, you know, private or public, that you do build that policy framework around um, leveraging AI because there will come a time when auditors will come in and want to take a look at um, how did you come up with the decision to leverage AI? Who, how was that uh, decision reached? Uh, what sort of testing was done? Um, you know what sort of impact assessment was was uh, was undertaken. So it, very important to to have a, a very clear documented decision process and, and evolution in your organization in terms of how you leverage this. I think um, you know thinking about the frameworks, um, they're all evolving as quickly as organizations are starting to implement these these um, these technologies. I, I'm not going to say there's there's one out there at all. Um, I, I think that probably the most mature ones, and and we don't have a, a, a capability a maturity model yet uh, that we're you know sort of um, measuring organizations against. Partially because if you look at the maturity, we would all be sort of at the, the low end of the scale in terms of implementation of that. So it, it doesn't really yield a lot. And I think in terms of overall maturity, you know, you can Gartner will have a model, Forrester has a model, and, and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know independent research out there that that'll come up with these models, um, but I do th think they are going to evolve over time um, rapidly. They all do, but these this one a little bit more rapidly as we start to see uh, successes and failures of implementation of AI, and we will see a lot of, of both of those. Um, I think you know the if I look at a framework, the ones that are going to be most successful are the ones that have built-in iterative process. So if you if you think of it as a once and done, um, you know you've got it wrong. And so, you know, there's a there's an element of, of uh, I think, professional humility that has to come into this so that you iterate through. There's some, you know, there's questions, you know, again, Gartner has some some great questions as an example. You know, does the technology work uh, well enough? Uh, you know, what are the legal regulatory issues? Uh, culturally, are you ready to, to uh, for those risks? Uh, you know, are you a leader or follower? So there's a, there's a whole suite of questions that you can ask to determine your own uh, level of of satisfaction for organizationally if you're ready to implement AI and that's you know that 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 should be where it starts I mean as I you know I said at the beginning you have to have a business strategy and understand where you're trying to get to but culturally as an organization are you prepared to um, you know not only uh, look at the adoption of this and what it requires from a bit of introspection in all those areas that I talked about you know privacy uh, and so forth um, but also have the uh, understanding that you're going to have to defend those decisions that you make. And I think that's really where, you know, it comes down to, and, you know, if there's any lawyers online, you know, I, 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 it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, a litigation sort of level of, of analysis on this, but you may end up there. And so the kind of work that you do to, to demonstrate your uh, maturity, your the maturity of process, the maturity of decision making and, and the maturity of implementation I think is going to go a long way in case you do end up in in uh, in litigation. So I think it, the field is 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 developing so quickly and so rapidly that um, you know your, your AI strategy almost needs a quarterly refresh to make sure that from an organizational context perspective it still makes sense to you. And so that's why you know from from a Treasury Board Secretary uh, Treasury Board of Canada Secretary perspective we put out the policy framework. We, we have some tools that allow for uh, the, the algorithmic impact assessment, as I mentioned, but it really becomes uh, more important to look at the departmental uh, context and, and the organizational context around risk, uh, risk tolerance and, and culture to be able to adopt these technologies. Thank you, Paul. That's, uh, that's excellent to know. I, I want to pivot a little bit, Paul, and touch on actually touch on something you just mentioned in your in your answer, Paul. And, and indeed, the field of AI is is advancing so rapidly, and and there's new progress being reported every day in scientific literature, in the popular press, mainstream media. So you know, one is uh, optimistic, one is filled with hope that wow, all these breakthroughs are happening, and so all kinds of new uh, new groundbreaking types of uh, use cases can be supported. But on the flip side, the issue of that is it's also a bit overwhelming. I mean, uh, we know that there's information overload 
workload. There's a saturation of relevant content out there, but who can basically go tackle all of it, Paul? So with the teams that you manage and with all of the other departments that you that you advise, how do you how do you kind of advise folks to stay on top of all of this super fast advancement that is happening? Happening. How do you keep on top of all that, Paul, and to be able to meaningfully then apply it to the business objectives or the departmental objectives? Yeah, I think I think that's where you know a lot of the uh, the smaller organizations um, you know have a, have a bit of a of a leg up. You know, they're, they they're able to take some time and and take a resource or two and and just put them in that innovation space, right? So you know, we're very good. We have an awful lot of of uh, we're very good at starting very large projects in the government uh, track record. Uh, you know, uh, put that one aside. That that could be a topic for a whole other discussion. But I do think organizations that spend time and resources um, and build into their corporate uh, framework and their corporate governance, um, you know, an, an area for innovation. I talk about it being a sandbox, you know, call it as you will. Um, but the ability for an organization to be able to think about the business problems and start and, and look at technology, because um, to be quite honest, you know, you're, you're right, Vic, you know, the, the plethora of, of, of tools and platforms out there, uh, you know, is, is only growing on every day. And you know, from a CIO perspective, the um, if I think back, you know, to to when I was CIO at Justice, or or you know, some of the the CIOs that predated me in some of the organizations in government, um, if the technology or or the solutions didn't come out of the the IT shop at the time, um, they weren't going to come from anywhere else. And that's you know, that was just the the reality of technology at the time was, and I would argue as CIOs back you know 15, 20 years ago we were more chief technology officers than chief information officers because the, you know, the technology was behind the data center. Um, you know, you, you spent the, a large part of your day making sure that your, inform your, your, your IT systems didn't fall down. And, and so, you know, your ability to get into the business uh, and understand the business was, was limited just because of, of, of your scale and scope of responsibility. Now with technologies like cloud, uh, you know, with, uh, with um, uh, software as a service, a lot of, a lot of our business owners are starting to be as tech savvy and as, as platform savvy and as digital savvy as, as CIOs are. So you're starting to get this, this sort of natural tension coming from other parts of the organization that would normally be consumers of, of technology and platforms. They're actually becoming the, the, the purveyors of those platforms and bringing them to the CIOs. And so, you know, the, the role of the CIO has, has changed dramatically. And, and I think happily, I think we're, you know, we're, we're into a space now where uh, we are starting to, to pivot on a lot more of the business topics. But I do think, um, you know, the, the fact that the, the landscape is changing that fast and that, that often, um, you need to have an understanding or, or create that understanding in an organization around what artificial intelligence is. It's a little bit like the word love. Everybody has their own definition of it today. Uh, you know, I think as organizations, and again, this is where, you know, from a government of Canada level, um, you know, it would be somewhat naive to think that we could do that writ large. I think it, we need to start to, you know, have a framework that talks about it at the government of Canada level, but has the dialogue actually happens departmentally, and in some cases in, in large organizations, maybe even smaller than that. But you do need to have, um, you know, resources and, and it, it, that sort of uh, governance built into your organization to allow for the testing of these things in a safe environment. So, you know, using anonymized data, using data sets, leveraging platforms. Again, we've got a um, we've got a standing offer of a list of companies that, that have been pre-qualified from uh, from a government perspective for, as uh, as AI platforms, you know. Take a couple of those, try it, and and you know have a bit of a bake off between them. See what it looks like. See what the what the the difference in the outcomes and the outputs are. Um, that's the only way you're going to start to build the muscle of of what you need to be looking for in some of these spaces. And and it is highly um, uh, business contextualized. So really important that you know again, if we could come up with a, an overarching statement, it would almost be so high level that it would be. Um, it wouldn't be applicable in, in specific instances. So that's why the directive is there, why the policy framework is there. These departments a sense of the kind of areas they need to, 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 to look into. Um, but I do think it's, it's a question of staying on top of it and, and, and letting the organization have that space to be able to, to innovate and to test out. Thank you, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm gonna. I have a few more questions too, but I'm going to now look at the chat. There's a number of excellent questions there. I'm gonna pass them through uh, in the order I see them. So I guess the first question here is, Paul, that how can AI researchers working on policy modeling make themselves more understandable to policymakers, even though their tools are new and seem more complex? 
<laughs> uh, oh, a, a great, a, a softball question. Um, I think this is a, uh, you know, whether we're talking about cloud, whether we're talking about AI, I think, you know, the, the proximity of, of policymakers and policy development shops in organizations uh, necessarily have to be have to start working closer with with the business side and with the IT side. You know, uh, it's no it's no um, uh, secret that the federal government. You know, some of our policies still talk about faxes and um, and uh, you know using telephone service and so forth. Um, you know, we, as I mentioned before, you know, probably the from my perspective, one of the the best indicators of a uh, of a mature uh, AI strategy is one that sees it being iterated through every quarter. You know, a lot of times when we build policies, certainly in the past, uh, because we didn't have the speed uh, and, and acceleration of, uh, of, of technology and of uh, culture that we do today, um, you know, we, we didn't have, we didn't build the muscle of policy refresh on a regular basis. And so I think, you know, to answer the question, it's one, ensure that, you know, in your policy framework, you build in a, a, a renewal process that is, you know, not years, uh, but is in, an, in, a, in a, a cadence that actually makes sense from a technology perspective, from a service delivery perspective. Um, and, you know, again, if you're measuring that in years, it's probably too long. So, you know, give yourself the framework that allows for that dialogue to happen. I think from, from a policy uh, perspective, um, you know, starting building out inter, inter, um, uh, interdepartmental for sure, but um, teams that have or inter interdisciplinary teams is really key from a policy perspective. I remember when I was working at, at Department of Justice and, and we were working on litigation or uh, legislation systems, you know, having getting the, all the, the people who are uh, involved in a specific piece of, of legislation in a room as the draft through the legislation, uh, that was, you know, at the time back in 2009 10, uh, and they were all sitting there looking at the legislation being modified as they worked through it. It was very, very uh, organic in terms of how that happened, but you had all of the players in the room that had a lens on the policy. And I think that model, you know, in 2021, it looks a little bit differently. Um, but I think if you set the framework up to be iterative and you start to build the, the, the bridge between policy and service delivery, um, immediately you bring in uh, all of those other elements of digital that I mentioned before. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is uh, this is another great question, Paul. I'm going to put up on the screen and one that I've been wondering about as well. So we know that AI changes and modifies the questions that uh, can be answered from a scientific perspective. So from the perspective of a central agency, specifically TBS, uh, how does the adoption of AI change the scientific agenda from your point of view, Paul? I think so. A great question. I'm probably not, you know, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. I, you know, we could have I'd love to have Dr. Mona Niemer on here one day. Maybe that would be a great, a great conversation. I think she would have some uh, some opinions on this, as would some some of the other folks in the in the scientific space. Again, I, you know, I, I got to spend uh, the last four years of my life working with the scientists um, in government, as, as well as uh, colleagues in academia and, and industry. And and I think you know you're right. It is going to change the question. Um, you know, AI is going to do that. Quantum is also going to do that. Quantum is going to change the questions that we're we're asking. And I think you know it, it's a little bit different uh, than than what we're talking about. Certainly, you know, my focus for the last uh, 35 minutes or so has been around some of the you know the corporate systems, the the, the citizen service delivery systems. I think from a from a scientific perspective, what it's going to do is you know we the the masses and, and of data that we have within the federal government um, and, and then more globally. So if you start to think about research domains, um, you know, uh, aerospace, um, astronomy and so forth, the, the volume of data that we have in those spaces um, is, is incredible. And, you know, you're right, up until now, it's only been what questions, uh, you know, did the scientists come up with uh, through experimentation, through iteration, working globally. Um, and the AI is going to is going to simply just amp, amp that game up in terms of the questions that we can ask and some of the questions that you know we haven't even thought about asking. So you know if you think about you know, although the, the the term is is has cooled a little bit, but the concept of big data, being able to mash data up between systems, um, you know our ability to do that, you know both within the federal government from a scientific perspective, but more globally. Uh, I think is going to be uh, critical. I think you know that's going to. We, we've got some work underway. I know in the federal government around building a, a science data strategy. Um, again, working with Dr. Niemer, thinking about you know how do we leverage the the uh, the data sets that we have within government that we share with with uh, with other organizations, and um, and I think that there's an element. One of the things that you know we need to do better as a community 
is the the barriers between um, or, or breaking down the barriers between academia and and government research. Um, there's there's an incredible power in, you know for the Canadian economy and uh, that there's very seamless between academia and government. And I think you know a little bit a little bit on the AI topic, but certainly it, you know the fact that we can now start to leverage data sets outside of government at solving some of the wicked problems that scientists you know within the federal government are charged with i think ai is going to allow for that uh, that discussion to happen thank you paul uh, that's a that that's a great insight uh, there's an interesting question now around the governance topic paul i know you touched quite a bit on the governance issue so you mentioned that oh, the I'm auditors a bit of, and a bit of uh, problem hearing are, you Okay, uh, so the question's on the screen, Paul. So what approach are you taking to document the controls around the process of adopting AI between the operational side and the project side? So from a governance IT audit perspective. Um, yeah, so, so sorry, great question. Sorry, I'm having a bit of uh, the uh, uh, streamers breaking up there a bit, Vic, so my apologies for that. So, so great question, I, I think, um, you know, from from the project perspective, again, you know, start finish. Um, you already have to have an understanding of how you want to leverage AI in that in a project. So, a project, you know, is not implementing AI. A project is, has an outcome that you know affects citizens, affects Canadian businesses. So, I think you know, from a project governance perspective, um, ensuring that again, um, you know, the project governance takes into account the the various areas um, that uh, need to be taken in from an AI perspective, as I mentioned before, the privacy, the the service delivery, and so forth. I think the operational side is 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 probably a more important one, uh, especially as uh, as an auditor uh, when you start looking back. And as I mentioned before, you know, um, when when we start to implement these these systems. The decisions that are made and the the impact on on Canadians is is really is paramount, um, and so I think the governance around the service delivery is 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 going to change. Whereas in the past, you know, a lot of the service delivery models that we have today through call, click, connect uh, with uh, with Canadians, um, a lot of those service delivery models have have been the same for a very long period of time, um, and have a, a a culture around them and have a governance around them. And I think the adoption of technologies that are going to displace some of the existing service delivery models require us to look at the governance. And I think it's a it's a it's a very very from a maturity perspective, I would say it's a very mature question um, that organizations need to ask themselves around you know not only the implementation of a technology but the governance around the service the service model uh, that exists. And so I think. Um, you know, it, it, it does. It is going to force us to look at different ways to govern services. It's going to look at, look to us to, to um, you know, hopefully over time uh, to leverage enterprise services. So, you know, one of, I would hate to see every every department building uh, an AI uh, supported service delivery model uh, where you know we had an opportunity to do it as an enterprise, do it once, build the 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 appropriate governance and oversight for that model. And then allow for departments to be able to leverage that. So again, you know, I, I think that's going to happen. And if you, you know, if if you have me back in in two or three years, I'll probably be hopefully talking about that as a rearview mirror type of activity that we've done it and we've started to you know build out the muscle on that. But I think you know, from a governance perspective, both operationally and project wise, it is going to challenge departments and organizations to do it. Uh, my concern is that I, I don't want to see that happen 160 different times uh, if it doesn't have to, right? I mean, I think there's some there's some real opportunities here to leverage some enterprise um, abilities. Great, thank you, Paul, and and definitely we'd love to have you back in two to three years. But the speed at which this thing's moving, we'd probably have you back more like six months from now. Sure, sounds good. Six weeks, that's but good that's good call. Great. Yeah. Uh, so there's an interesting question. Before I put this in chat, I want to kind of uh, preamble this with my question that I had, and then I think you can kind of take the question from the chat and my question together. So, you know, it's very interesting that as we talked about earlier, Paul, uh, the field of AI is advancing. Every day there's all these new algorithms, these new breakthroughs being recorded, uh, reported. And indeed, I mean, for sure, not all, but many of them may actually have uh, very relevant organizational implications in terms of value, in terms of goal attainment. Uh, Oftentimes, Paul, you know, we don't hear a lot about RPA, even though, uh, I mean, even in, in my department, I've seen some very creative uh, thoughts around prototyping RPA solutions, piloting proof of concepts, uh, and, and I've seen other organizations actually putting RPAs at scale. 
how do you see RPA fitting within an ensemble or a portfolio of a larger kind of intelligent automation solutions? And I'll put the question on chat as well, where this colleague is asking that being on the theme of AI being more so a people in process can play the technology one, thoughts on intelligent automation as a way forward to leveraging AI technologies. So perhaps you can answer it sort of together with my question as well, Paul, is where does RPA fit in your mind in that broader kind of ensemble of machine learning, deep learning and everything else but now also RPA as a viable set of uh, capabilities. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, great question. And th this is showing sort of the speed and, 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 and rapidity with which, you know, we're evolving, um, we're evolving these technologies. Um, absolutely. The place to, to, for, for RPA to, to play, certainly in some of our heavy service, uh, you know, service to citizen uh, organizations, I think of ESDC, I think of CBSA and so forth. Um, and I do think, you know, organizations are starting to think about this. And certainly, you know, the, the last year that we've we've been uh, working remotely has given, uh, you know, again, a pause for for thought around how we deliver services in a more uh, in a more agile manner, in, in, in a much more rapid manner. Um, but I do think, you know, a lot of those, as I was talking about, a lot of those service strategies that we have in place today in organizations, and in some cases, you know, those those service strategies need to be renewed, refreshed. Uh, just to, just to understand where, where we're at today. Um, I, I think, you know, leveraging AI, leveraging RPA uh, needs to become part of a departmental strategy in terms of, of, of how that fits. Again, from a Government of Canada perspective, um, because of the disparity in, in, in the departments, it'd be very hard to say, well, here's our RPA play from a Government of Canada perspective, or here's our, our artificial intelligence play from a Government of Canada perspective. Um, and certainly, you know, you're not going to see that type of, of, of direction coming out of, of Treasury Board. But I do think as departments look at the, the opportunities that are in front of them, uh, you know, back to your, your, your former question around, you know, how do you start to leverage and, and think about some of these newer technologies um, is, is the ability to just is to safely uh, test them out. Um, because, you know, a, a service strategy at Employment and Social Development Canada um, you know, as they start to to evolve their programs and their ability to support new programs that the government of the day wants to implement, um, you know, the ability to to, to leverage RPA uh, specifically, but also AI, is 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 only going to help um, iterate through and, and be able to deliver those services quicker. We saw it with the you know the creation of of CERB. You know, that was done in a matter of weeks as opposed to what would have you know normally taken months, um, if not longer. Um, and now it was it was a relatively simple benefit, you know, compared to some of the other benefits that we have that have decades of, of history in terms of, of uh, decisions. But I do think, you know, if you if you take a, uh, a bit of a greenfield approach and think about how do we deliver a program or service leveraging these types of technologies and then testing it out. I, I can't I can't speak to that enough in, in a safe environment um, is 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 the way to go. I don't, and, and in talking to departments, you know, Shared Services Canada, absolutely looking at RPA as we speak, Raj Dupal, who's their, their chief technology officer there, and I have had discussions around this, but, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm saying that our, our adoption and our uh, analysis of AI is, is, is low on the overall maturity scale from a departmental, most departments perspective, I think RPA is probably, uh, you know, following that one as well. Very interesting, Paul. Thank you. Great. Actually, in your most recent answer, it's almost like you predicted the question I'm going to now put on the screen. It's a question on the chat. You talked about sort of the notion of decision making being more disaggregated, being more kind of fragmented and for good reason due to autonomy and just due to uh, mission critical or idiosyncratic uh, priorities of different departments. But the question here is about, uh, is there a subset uh, common? Uh, maybe, you know, we can think about from a best practice perspective or reusable components yeah. perspective or patterns. Uh, is there something out there or are there plans like something out there Paul to build something that folks from multiple departments can use yeah um, so a great question and I think you know um, one of the things that we're we're advancing rapidly in, in the federal government is is the concept of, of enterprise we've seen that the value of, of acting as an enterprise certainly as it, when it came to COVID, you know, our ability uh, to to uh, a deliver continue the delivery of service to Canadians uh, our ability to mobilize, you know, 250,000 plus employees to be able to work remotely, um, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure considerations behind that one, you know, that was thanks to the work of Shared Services Canada and not, you know, certainly the work of the day, you know, in March 16th, a uh, year ago, uh, almost, you know, when, when we had to make some, some really uh, tough decisions and really rapid decisions. 
but it really came on the back of the fact that we've been talking and working towards enterprise um, decision frameworks, enterprise services for a long time. And you know, Paul Glover, president of, the, of Shared Services Canada, when he started at, at SSC, um, you know, put in this concept of of, um, of SSC 3.0. And the idea was, you know, start small and then scale and then and then you know roll it out to to the the entirety of the of an organization. That's not for every service, but there are there are many many services and. I the ones that were identified in that question around HR, finance, and some of these other spaces, we that same paradigm makes sense. And we're starting to look at, um, you know, I, I co-chair uh, what's known as the Government of Canada Enterprise Architecture Review Board uh, with uh, with Raj Dupal over at, at Shared Services. And we, uh, at Architecture Review Board, departments come and bring their um, their proposals for architecture that they're putting in place and so forth. And, you know, certainly before the meetings that we have, but the teams look at those opportunities and we are starting to, we're starting to bundle those, those, um, those initiatives um, and start looking, you know, and we have looked at enterprise systems. We've got a, a, a plethora of enterprise systems that are, that are in place today. And I think those are systems, as I mentioned before, you know, not seeing everybody do it 160 times where they don't have to. Um, starting to leverage AI and RPA uh, in those enterprise systems is ways that we can actually start to see some really, really um, achievable results that are at scale across the entire organization. I think, you know, right now, um, the work that's underway uh, in, in, in pockets in some of those organizations is going to uh, inform and, uh, um, you know, provide a bit of a backdrop in terms of what can be done in some of those enterprise systems, because I imagine, um, again, thinking of you know leveraging a, a bridge or bridging platform and putting it in an enterprise system, your impact back to the algorithmic impact assessment, your impact is 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 much more significant than if you're doing it in a small pipe uh, and a small a small window of uh, of um, of beneficiaries. So I think the answer is absolutely yes. It needs to be done horizontally. It makes sense. Um, and I think that's how we're going to get the, beta, the the greatest gain for organizations where they don't have to go and do it on their own. Excellent, Paul. Thank you. Uh, one more question. So we talked about the importance of partnerships and collaborations more from a relational perspective. So there's a question here that uh, what is your advice to organizations uh, that wish to work closely with the government of Canada more on a relational basis other than from an RFP, which is a bit more transactional? How would you advise them, Paul, to engage with the thought leaders within the government of Canada? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, we, you know, we've got uh, a number of venues for that to happen. Um, we have a, a, an architecture framework uh, advisory council that, uh, again, Raj and I seem to be chairing a lot of meetings together. We, he and I chair that. Um, and, and, you know, that's a place where uh, we invite um, industry to come in and talk to us about, um, you know, a specific topic here. So the, the latest one we had was around zero trust networks and zero trust architectures. And so as, as Shared Services Canada starts to think about networks of the future, we wanted to, uh, you know, inform and, and uh, inspire that uh, that model, that framework, uh, with industry experts, people that have, you know, gone and done this before. And so we had a great uh, two great sessions actually with with companies from across the country as well as as globally, uh, informing us on what they thought was were some of the key elements. Um, I think, you know, another way to do it, the, uh, we have a, a digital operations strategic plan. Uh, it's going to be renewed in the next uh, couple, couple of weeks and in line with an overall Government of Canada digital vision. Um, and, and so I would, I would definitely encourage vendors, industry to, to look at that digital operations strategic plan and use it as a bit of a framework in terms of talking to CIOs, in terms of talking to, you know, the Treasury Board and, and Shared Services Canada in places that they think that, you know, uh, they can provide leadership or that they see an area that actually, uh, from a Government of Canada perspective, you know, we, we, could, we could look at differently. Um, there's a, we're, we have, we've started a number of challenges. Uh, we just had one that was on, um, it was more focused on, on the digital ID space. But the, the, the model of, of challenges uh, and, and challenging industry uh, to be able to help work on some innovative um, projects is, is really taking, uh, taking charge. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we just did one with, uh, with ICED around digital ID and, and I anticipate us doing more. And finally, I would say, you know, especially for the small companies, small and medium sized companies out there, um, you know, th there are an awful lot of programs um, within the federal government. There's the Industrial Research Assistant Program at, um, 
uh, at the, the National Research Council. Uh, there's uh, Solutions Canada. So there's, there's a number of ways that uh, companies can demonstrate their, uh, their, their experience, their, their, their wares in a specific area, working with, again, you know, it, it, we're not going to boil the ocean with uh, a, a social, uh, you know, a benefit delivery platform and taking, you know, a, a, a product that we're not going to go to RFP for but sitting there in a, in a uh, sandbox and testing a technology out, testing a model, testing an approach out with a department on a specific outcome, I think that's absolutely achievable given the, the, the constraints that we have in, in place today from a procurement perspective. And I do think, you know, over time, you know, this is one of those areas I was talking about policies before, about, you know, talking about facts and so forth. Um, you know, I'm not going to say procurement reform. I'm not, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to talk about, you know, the things that I think um, need to happen, but I do think I, I can tell you that there we are reiterating through in terms of procurement. Just the adoption of being able to procure software as a service is changing the way that our public service and procurement Canada is looking at those those procurements and working with Shared Service Canada and PSPC um, that will continue to evolve. So RFPs are probably a thing of our future, um, but I do think there's other ways that we're we're looking at in terms of being, organizations being able to uh, uh, to demonstrate uh, their their uh, their successes. Thank you, Paul. So we have just a couple minutes left and I'll ask you a question, although I'm not sure if it'll fit in the, the time allocated. So we this will be kind of our hook to make sure that you do come back to perhaps, uh, I promise sure. I'll probably ask you this question again, but uh, let me ask the question and let me give you a bit of my, my, my perspective on it and then love to get your thoughts to close us out. So one of the challenges that hiring managers that uh, are focusing on data science uh, point out an issue around talent, right? It's very hard to attract talent. It's very hard to retain, recruit uh, talent. Now, from my perspective, one of the interesting things is that uh, since I've been involved with the Synthetic Intelligence Forum, I've had access to great data scientists and I've been able to kind of tap that network to be able to bring uh, top talent into the organization. But I know that more broadly speaking, a lot of decision makers, a lot of hiring managers in Ottawa and beyond have issues with uh, hiring talent. What's some of your tips and tricks to folks that are looking to hire good bona fide data scientists into their orgs? How would you say they go about it doing it in the right way? So we're gonna end off on an easy question, in other words. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, yeah, talent, talent is, and I'd love to come back and talk about talent. You know, it, when you look at the talent across the federal public service, um, we've got a, an enormous wealth of talent. Um, but back to, you know, we, we, we silo that talent into 160 organizations and it becomes very vertically focused in terms of delivering, uh, delivering outcomes. Uh, I think there's, you know, a lot of the, the work that we're doing, whether it's around sort of a product management approach, whether it's around enterprise approach, we're starting to see the ability to leverage talent from wherever those organ wherever those those people sit. So again, thinking about our response to the uh, the COVID crisis, you know, we had to put out, uh, you know, the prime minister stood up on a, on a Monday morning, I think it was Monday, and and you know mentioned the uh, uh, the um, the CERB benefit, and within weeks uh, we had it up and running. Uh, we pulled teams, we pulled people from across the government to be able to deliver that in a, in a way that was, uh, you know, that quick and that secure and that safe. Uh, we leveraged, you know, cloud technology and we're able to, to, to put that, that benefit up. I think, you know, one of the things organizations should never do is simply look at the people that you have in your organization. I think you need to, A, look beyond. Um, and, you know, that, that causes for some natural tension, natural poaching that happens between departments. And, you know, there's a team at Treasury Board uh, Secretariat looking at that uh, under Denise Skinner, looking at how do we actually help manage the talent pool that we have. So not only the attraction of, uh, of, of, of new talent to the federal government, but how do we manage the, 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 the talent pool that we have within our, our, our four walls of government. The other is, you know, I think uh, leveraging, and, and I'll take a page out of the National Research Council, um, you know, each of the, the research centers at the NRC uh, leans heavily on work with um, uh, postdocs and, and co-ops. And so I think there's an enormous amount of, of uh, talent and, uh, and a attitude um, and aptitude coming out of universities. And I think, you know, as the government, we can do a, a better job of leveraging uh, that talent, both when they're, they're in the space of, of their learning curriculum, but also as, as they come out, um, I think there's opportunities there for us to be able to leverage that. I think, you know, the permeability of the, of the public service is, is definitely, you know, increasing. And so we're seeing people come in and come out of the public service. And again, you know, our policies and procedures need to start to adjust to be able to adapt to that. Um, because, you know, I don't know that, uh, you know, a, a 20 something year old today looks to spend, looks forward and says, I'm going to spend the next 35 years working for government. There will be some, 
but from a talent perspective and from a, a skills perspective, I think we need to be able to you know, adapt to that possibility, but we also need to have frameworks in place so um, to, to allow for that permeability of, of students, of, of people from private sector to be able to come in, uh, you know, leverage their, their experience uh, and, and offer them new experiences um, and then have them go, you know, move on in their career. And so I think, you know, uh, from a mindset perspective, organizations need to look broader than their their existing base. And you know, again, from the professional humility lens, um, it's a little bit like cloud was, and it still is to a certain degree. We're learning, and so absolutely learning along the way is great. But you have to learn with somebody. You have to have a teacher. And and, and I think there's organizations out there that have uh, moved along uh, further than us. And I think we need to be able to find ways to be able to 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 partner with them. And there are creative ways to make that happen for sure. But like I said, you're absolutely correct. We could spend a whole uh, whole other session talking about that. So with that, Paul, thank you so much for a very engaging uh, fireside chat, if we can call it that. And I really appreciate all the insight that you shared and definitely some of the colleagues you mentioned, your peers, we'd love to have them in the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. Uh, in fact, we have a few of them secured. I just haven't had the occasion to put those out on the web yet. But thank you so much, Paul. Great conversation. Would love to have you back, not just in two years from now, but perhaps in a couple of months so you can give us a, a bit of an accelerated retrospective and also sure. another look ahead. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for your Happy time. Happy to. Thank Bye you very now. much. Thank Take you, care. everybody.